So welcome to the uh, Department of Psychosocial and Psychoanalytic Studies and the uh, Comparative Psychoanalysis Research Group. And we're very pleased to have Dr. Anna Arano um, from New York um, speaking to us about um, the chapter, her chapter in the book, um, uh, Psychoanalysis and the Mind-Body Problem, which was uh, edited by Professor John Mills and recently won the Gravida Award for the best edited book. Um, so Anna is um, was born in Rome and educated in England, London, Paris, um, and then went to New York. And she had a career as a ballerina. Um, and then she uh, trained in psychoanalysis and went into academia and uh, has done a lot of writing. Um, and she, she also won a Gravida Award in 2020. So she's done a lot of synthesis of uh, complex ideas. And uh, she's going to speak, give us a kind of overview of her paper with, from the point of view, I think, of uh, her journey of making a synthesis from certain important uh, principles in psychoanalysis. So, um, Anna, uh, over mm -hmm. to you. Okay, so first of all, thank you very much for coming. And um, that is exactly right. I don't I don't think that it's a good idea to just read through the chapter all over again. So I'm going to just read a couple of captions from the abstract. And then I'm going to talk around it so that you understand the context, the timing of when these ideas came together and also the person to whom these ideas came. So in the abstract, which I don't think it appears in the book, by the way, I'm very honored to have been part of this book because it's varied and I'm very fond of John and it's really the cream of the, the contributors are all the cream of psychoanalysis today from very different aspects. What happened? Nothing? Did something happen? I've lost your voice. Can you hear me? Oh, I, I was on mute. I'm oh. muting myself just so that okay. you, the dog won't interrupt you. Oh, okay. So um, in the abstract, which is not in the book, one of the latter captions said that says that after taking the common dream as legitimate object of scientific scrutiny, Freud produced a masterwork of observation in which he arrives at his first topographical theory of mind, the cornerstone of early psychoanalytic theory in chapters six and seven, present a detailed analysis of the two-tiered structure, motive force, the formal properties and compositional grammar of a primary process, vocabulary of the deepest unconscious. Linguistic dream interpretation as a bridge between unconscious and conscious through the preconscious. Freud believed his theory of dreams held promise for the study of mental evolution. Yet Freud's great edifice of observation and theoretical foundations lies on the bedrock of residues from his neurological days and a paradigm borrowed from physics, couched in metaphors of repressive forces and shifting forms of energy, a dynamic meta theory of mind in search of real functional processes as explanatory base. To the end, Freud lamented that the Weltanschauung of his day could not provide concepts to answer how the unconscious becomes conscious. This is pivotal in my work because it appears in his lengthy uh, paper in his Papers of Metapsychology, 1915. So this issue of what happens in the transformation was a very big problem for him. So the, the, the chapter then 
continuing the abstract is an overview of Freud's early core concepts is followed by the author's revision of his topographical model into a seamless developmental biosemiotic theory of mind, later expanded into a study of human communication. The epigenetic model of mind in interaction illustrates how language and dialogues retain deep roots at less differentiated interpersonal levels, regardless of how abstractly a semiotic system is used, generating bidirectional semantic fields. Specifically, the model uncovers a psychoanalytic epistemology, a way of thinking, articulated through different semiotic forms. The model generates a shift towards an interpenetrative paradigm rooted in functional organizations governing experience, knowledge, and communication, illustrating the semiotic advantage that is unique to our species as paramount in our adaptation. Okay, so how, how did I even get to such a thing? Well, David has told me to tell you that having been a ballerina, I had the first half of my life was in my body, very aware of my biological base. And I had always been very interested in Freud and had gone uh, through one analysis and then another with another, another in another school of thought. And um, when I had to make the transition, this transformation of living in movement physically to having to sit for many hours and read and think and understand was a palpable experience. So the body-mind subject was experientially real to me. So I think this is probably why certain things stood out to me in Freud's opus that may not have stood out to others. But anyway, I had no degrees. I, I had been a ballerina from very early on. And um, so I was midstream in life, already with clear, uh, critical thinking. I spoke languages. I came from the arts. And so I enter academia. I, I quickly go through the BA, studying things that I think are relevant to psychoanalysis. I don't know why, but things like physiology, anatomy, neuroanatomy, um, just certain basics. And then I go to the New School, which is a wonderful university in New York, founded by the Jewish expats, including Hannah Art um, from the 30s, very liberal and open. And there were many psychoanalyst professors, which is very unusual in this country. Uh, psychoanalysis is not recognized in universities, and it's it was an unusual um, strike of fortune to have found a group of professors that were all psychoanalysts. And I started my uh, advanced academic work. And there was a lot of Freud. And the professor that I would like to single out was Arnold Wilson, because he was young, straight out of the Columbia group. That is, it bridges Freud. And he threw at us all of the contemporary papers. And what was happening in the early to mid 80s in New York was a real crisis. Um, first of all, the field had dispersed and fragmented. There were six or seven schools of thought, all in different institutes, and everyone clung to some focal idea and forgot the other things in psychoanalysis. So. Um, Psychoanalysis was in a severe paradigm crisis. The argument of the moment, after all the major ego psychologists had died, except people like Gill was still alive, was what to do with metapsychology. Was psychoanalysis a science? Could it be made into a science? Or was it better to just scrap it as a science altogether? And and just consider it a clinical theory. Well, we know that psychoanalysis is more than that. It's three things in one. It's a clinical method. It's a theory of mind and a, and a model. It's a, it, it's a real scientific model of how the mind works. 
in its complexity and wholeness. So again, I'm a novice and I read all this stuff and I go to all the all the meetings and I listen and I watch Grunbaum and Hansen, who is a Canadian philosopher, argue vehemently about whether what to do with metapsychology. And I think, so what is science? Science is a systematization of phenomena given a certain angle, right? It's phenomena that can be systematized in categories and regularities. Well, certainly we can't systematize the narratives of our patients because they're completely, each one is completely different. So clearly the science is not there. And uh, in, in reading Freud, I realized that he'd actually already said that. He said, the science of psychoanalysis lies not in its content, but in how it works. And that takes you to his papers on metapsychology. The complexity at that time when Freud was working of understanding how the unconscious is made conscious through talking, because that's our medium, talking. My question was, why haven't we been studying language? Why haven't we been studying dialogues? Why haven't we been studying narrativity? Which is what how the method works. It works in a dialogue. And so I, I wondered why the field had, had been so devoted to Freud's metaphors and analogies rather than looking at what there was in contemporary writings that might illuminate us. So I started reading Bakhtin. I started reading Vygotsky and Luria. I started reading uh, on narrativity, on narration, the various stages. And I was again fortuitously lucky in having a marvelous professor, Robert Sapolsky, young guy from Harvard for a summer course in behavioral biology. He was a pupil of Ed, Edward O. Wilson. And this introduced me to the whole biological underlay. And then another professor whose name I don't remember, unfortunately, introduced me to Suzanne Langer. And I started to realize that the piece that's missing in Freud, and I wondered why, because there were already studies in semiosis at his time, was semiosis itself, that we are biosemiotic. We are born little biological bundles, and then very quickly, our experience is mediated by a semiotic medium, language, words. And our experience becomes filtered through this mediation. So it was not helpful to keep the original topographical theory in terms of systems that are moved by energy. Energy, by the way, was the, the worst imaginable. What those who were against metapsychology really claimed that energy was, was the disaster of Freud's metapsychology. And so replacing energy with organizations of semiotic planes in a revised model of mind that accorded with neuroscience of the day, this is still the mid eighties, late eighties now, and explained this transformation that occurs seemed to me to be the way. So, you know, as you study time comes and you have to do a dissertation. Well, I couldn't do math to save my life and I couldn't do statistics and I also, was of the opinion that it was a big mistake to try to force empirical studies on a subject, the one I had chosen, symbolization. And I wanted to do an, a non-empirical thesis. And my university was not charted for that, even though I wrote and I wrote and I appealed and they couldn't. So I had to go elsewhere to do my dissertation. And my dissertation was proposing a developmental paradigm for a new psychoanalytic general theory of mind. Freud's first general theory of mind, not the structural, that's later and it's more clinical. This was general. And I, 
I found a place where I could do it, another university, and I had to compile my own uh, committee. And I chose uh, people from very varied fields. I chose an anthropologist who had written from Harvard, but lived in New York, who had written several books disputing the fact that um, prehistoric baton markings, which are basically lines, are simply geometrical designs. What he had uncovered was that quite the contrary, they were lunar markings, which indicated that our prehistoric ancient family members were already using signs and in many cases symbols. He was, he was very much, uh, he was a revolutionary, but he was demonstrating that the semiotic function was already there in prehistory. So I was very interested in that. I was interested in Bakhtin, who studies and writes about dialogue. I studied narrativity. I went to several conferences on narration, narrativity, and I developed this model. And I presented it for my dissertation. And at the dissertation defense was one of the members of the committee who said, well, we, we need to tell in, International Universities Press was then the most prestigious psychoanalytic publisher. And they took me on and they said, make it into a book, not, not a, so much a, a dissertation, but a book. So this is the book. Here it is. Can you see it? It's, it's a hefty book. Uh, it took me many years to write because I had to rewrite it. And it presents a revised model of mind. Stages of symbolizational development. And it, I will show you here roughly. Can you see it? Yeah. OK, so the revision incorporates um, the unlogged, the, the basis of how what we're born with. And I call it the protosensory unlogger. It's global, it's organismic, it's sensory experience. It's predisposed for psychosomatic schemata and affective intensity so that we're born with eight primary emotional expressions. Each of them has sounds and visual and even physical and physiological impact as well. That, that we read immediately. We read that and we react to this expressive underlay. So then the second uh, level is Freud's thing presentation. It's enacted memory. It's what in, in our clinical work is acted out, but not remembered. So it's already a little bit more formed. It has, I call it primal or archetypal signs and signals. Uh, if you think of the dream, the dream has a metaphorical structure, but each of the semiotic forms appears in a dream. The signals in the, in the intensity of the emotion which as it becomes represented through a dream turns into signs and symbols. They're all there in the dream. So this second level is enacted. It's what we remember physically, but haven't yet brought to mind, not yet mediated into a semiotic form. The third one is the symbolic function itself, and that is single words and language. Once the infant or the toddler starts naming, the activity of representation, the semiotic mediation accelerates because it, it has a generalized effect. You know, by calling, by knowing that the bottle is what you want and can call it, or pronounce it in whatever you want, but know that that is an object that has a name, the configuration of the brain changes completely. The, the child begins to devour language. 
and and use it to mediate their environment to get pretty much what they want. The, the fourth of these levels of the six epigenetic levels is primary single symbolization. And here we've entered into what we call the secondary process. We're able to put things into words, but not yet aware of being conscious. So we can talk, we can say things, but it's not yet the full-fledged self-reflection of, of awareness that the absorbing ego brings in an analysis. So th this is all language. And of course, uh, for all of you who know development, I, I should also add that, yes, I, in my undergraduate, I, I studied lifespan development. So I studied a lot of child and infant development. And then at the new school, there was a lab, there was a research lab run by Margaret Mahler, whom I assume you're all familiar with, Margaret Mahler. She, she was the theoretical exponent of the separation individuation process, which starts at 18 months. And I was there for two years observing toddlers in these experimental situations where the mother would leave the room and we would uh, study the reactions. So I was keenly aware also of what I believe to be the basic drives, which of which attachment is a very, very powerful one. And I don't know why I bring it up now, but, but certainly in, in a good analysis, the issue of how someone attaches is fundamental because the transference occurs in the attachment. So it connects. So the, the, the fifth, uh, the fifth, level of organization is called, I call it, secondary symbolization. And it's the beginnings of being aware of not only what you're saying, but being really conscious of the ideas in through language. It's a higher level of linguistic use. Language starts out as indexical. In other words, the, the object is given a name, but that is, that is only an index. It's not yet a symbol. Um, and then anyway, the, to, to just finish with the model, the, the sixth is called reification of the self. And this is what we do in psychoanalysis. We enter a process by which the analysts analyzing and probing and questioning and analyzing what is occurring and what occurred develops an observing ego, which is an artificial, it's an artificial construct in the mind that people who have not been in analysis don't necessarily have because it's very self-reflective and it, you become aware of being aware. And Freud made these distinctions, it was very important to keep that in mind, that everything that I'm saying in a different form, a different language, he had already noticed and, but couldn't explain, basically, couldn't explain. So having, uh, I like to make uh, diagrams like this because then I have an image of what I'm thinking and then I can fill it out. Of course, tied to all of these uh, stages is memory and the, the different forms of memory that are applied in our, in our work, in our clinical work. So I would say that the first book, other than dealing with the paradigm conflict of the moment and trying to bring together all these fragmented schools, which now have only multiplied. If there were seven then, now there are 12 each one clinging to one aspect of psychoanalysis, I was trying to find what is the foundational model of mind? Can't we just use that? And it answered a lot of questions. It proved to be very generative. And at, at the core of many of the papers I wrote later on very different subjects. So um, to go back a little bit, let me see. So, um, I'm just trying to think, having given an overview 
if how I can enter into more of the discussion or perhaps if there's anyone who has a question, that would be wonderful too. So going, going through the first part of this paper, now maybe I, what I would actually like to do is, I would like to say that if you're really interested in understanding all of the details that went into this revised model of mind, uh, it would be worth buying the book because I can't possibly recapitulate or even find all the details uh, in the uh, that I include in that in that first book to to present the argument that my model is basically Freud's model, but it has a it's it adopts a contemporary language of functional processes, real functional processes, not metaphors from physics. The, you know, the idea of, of uh, masses being shifted by forms of energy, moving, uh, explaining the transformation from unconscious to conscious, cathexis, whatever that is. These are organizations of experience that become mediated by language in dialogue at different levels. So I, I could actually go into, um, well, I could go into this. So the, the essence of Freud's topographical model is in chapter six and seven of his interpretation of dreams. And he identifies the processes of the dream work, right? As the primary process mechanisms of condensation, displacement, means of representation, and secondary revision. Well, when you pick these apart, these are semiotic forms within the the broader framework of a metaphoric structure. The dream is a metaphoric structure with each of these semiotic functions working to represent the experience that is at still unknown. So the transition in, in the interpretation is that in our dialogue, we work around the associations. So we pull together the, the fragments of memory that belong to each of the dream elements so that the element, which is pictographic and pictorial and index, acquires the deeper meaning that the subject of the dream, dream, the dreamer doesn't even know yet. So he's the dream is advanced, it's ahead of the dreamer. The problem is that um, the Freudian basic theory of why we dream is wish fulfillment. But when you couch it in semiotic mediating terms, you find that this is simply how the mind works. This is how it works all the time. We gradually represent our experience if we've placed it in memory. So the wish, although it's present as a driving force, it's not always present. There are times when you actually see a dream that is just pushing to tell you something that you don't yet know. Okay, so I use, I use the dream a lot. I am very much an adherent of Freudian dream analysis. And for me, the, the dream was explanatory, not just for his topographical model with only three systems, but for the whole process of how our clinical work works which is this gradual mediation from what is still in the body and what is in psychosomatic diseases expressed through the body, through a symptom, that we mediate the somatic into slowly through emotions, into language and into subjective awareness. Um, okay, so now we'll move to yeah, this took a lot of integration um, and I, I well, I'm, I'm not going to go into every single book that I read, but it took a lot of integration also from, from psychoanalytic developmental studies, but also from psychology. 
And so, again, the core question, what characterizes psychoanalysis as a science is not the material which it handles, but the technique with which it works. How does it work? It works in a dialogue, as a conversation. But what kind of dialogue and what kind of talking? And that's where I was going after the first book. So there are a few things that are so foundational that I really have to readdress them. And one of them is to differentiate signals from signs and symbols. So at the least differentiated level of interaction, whether it's childhood or in an analysis, at the least differentiated, the communication is the communication that is of interest to us is at the signal level. So I'm going to give you an example of signal signs and symbols proper. I don't know if it will be a good example, but I'll try. So the signal conveys, expresses itself. How is it received? It's received by a reaction. So let no, I'm going to do the color later. So the signal is received as a reaction. We see it. In humans, it's emotional. In animals, it's cries, usually sound cries, or in birds, it's their plumage. But in humans, we have eight fundamental emotional uh, reactions, and we respond to them. The second level is of signs. Once the sign is introduced, it serves either an indicative or a denotive function. It can either point to or denote something, denote the name of something or what you call something, a name of a person, a thing. So it's just naming. The formation of the symbol proper is much more complex because the symbol proper can mean many things. It's probably the most complex form of meaning. That's not to say that ancient civilizations didn't have symbols, but they weren't perceived as symbols. They were perceived as indexes, hence the, the superstitions. So for instance, if we take red, red in a traffic light is a signal, stop. Red as a sign is, let me think a minute, because I did have it, now I've forgotten what it was. Well, if anybody can volunteer. <laughs> um, red as a sign has an indicative function only. So I can't think of it. I'm so sorry. But um, you will forgive me, you know. It, um, but red as a symbol, the red rose of love, the rose that encompasses the emotions the memories, the feeling of what a red rose means to you personally, individually. So th the point that I'm trying to make at the bottom of all of this is that meaning uh, is contextual. It's very specific to the moment, the purpose of the speaker, how it's received. Meaning isn't a fixed thing. And so all of this leads basically to my second book. And how did I get there? Well, having finished the dissertation now in psychoanalytic training, uh, really very happy to be in psychoanalytic training after all those courses in psychology, which I wasn't crazy about. Um, there is the possibility in New York to enter a supervisory program. I had probably been already doing clinical work for a couple of years at the Institute and uh, graduate fac the graduate um, program in psychoanalysis supervision was very, very prestigious and very hard to get into. But I thought, okay, so I'll try. This will be the last leg of training uh, not expecting actually to get into it, um, but I did. 
And so it's a two year program and it it's opens up a whole voluminous amount of new literature. Extremely interesting with phenomena I was not that familiar with like the parallel process. And this particular uh, institute had a wonderful ob observ observational lab. And once a week, we all, in addition to the courses, in courses, papers and readings, we had once a week, we observed a novice supervisor supervising their patient. So we have novice supervisors watching a novice supervisor working with their patient, right? And our professors are sitting with us. So what was amazing in the experience of this observational lab was especially from the fact that I was already watching this with the original model in mind, with my model of mind in mind, right? So all the semiotic levels. So what would happen is we would watch the whole session, we would take notes, and then there was a post-session discussion. We all left the lab with this, this was a one-way mirror, so we could watch but not be seen. We would all move to another room and then the novice that had been observed would join the group and I would watch a phenomenon which I had never palpably even conceived of, which was the parallel process taking place amongst the group members. And it was unequivocal. You could feel it. You could feel it in the room. And the teachers were also trying to convey that this was something to try to observe and try to catch it. What were the patterns? What was being enacted? Who was taking on which role? Um, who were the characters that were being transferred into the, into the post-session group discussion that belonged to the patient even, or the patient's symptoms? So I thought this was almost extraordinary. And I started to take notes with respect to the model that I had devised, which was all these epigenetic levels of interaction. And this continued for two years. So it was a very, very in-depth, completely new experience requiring new studies, new readings, because uh, I didn't know very much about the emotions, for instance. I didn't, I had to study emotions. Um, I had to study, re-study uh, groups, what happens in groups, uh, some group phenomena. And at the end of the two years, we, we had to write a sort of a little dissertation, which, which I did, I wrote, um, based on my observations of the semiotic levels. And my publisher saw this dissertation or I showed them to and, and said, okay, we, we would like a second book. So it, it, I did not have a book. I had a, you know, I had a paper basically, that was it. Um, but the opportunity of reformulating the whole supervisory situation with the addition of these semiotic levels and how they reverberated in the group was very, very interesting to me. So I embarked on the second book and I'm rather fussy about how I write. I write much better than I speak, I hope. <laughs> um, but how to conceptualize what, what I was going to write about. And the, the word that came to my mind is forms, forms of knowledge. These are ways of knowing in an epistemology that addresses the unconscious and therefore also the body and what the body conveys and what we see when we're looking at patients and what we hear in the 
in the tonalities of voice. In other words, ways of knowing that have a much vaster um, range of stimuli that psychoanalysis has adopted. And so I had to do more readings because I wanted to know about Kuhn, I wanted to know about paradigm change, I wanted to know about philosophy of language. At the time, it was a cons the, the atmosphere was constructivist, that we create our perceptions by our own subjective experience. And so the second book takes on uh, other aspects of what the first book wasn't really knowledge about and is more complex. It's, so this was the model that I designed for the second book. Again, I designed these what they look like graphs, but I do it so that I can organize my thinking. And this second one has memory. It has types of, of reference along uh, an epigenetic model of memory that starts by replication, only later becomes denotive and then is narratized and then is worked through. It basically addresses working through. What is working through in our clinical process? Working through is a neuro, it's a biological process, it's a neurobiological process, as Ghetto wrote, that works through emotions that are attached to memories, reconnects them, and then mediates them with language that indicates that we are aware that we are creating a new narrative that is not as charged emotionally as the unconscious one was. So it's a new narrative. So obviously I had to put narration and narrativization. Well, when you study narrative with people who've studied narrative, you know that there are different kinds of narrative that actually even in our history, we've gone through ways of recording history uh, along a developmental scale. You know, before it was just a sort of a, a list, lists, then they turned into chronolo chronological lists, then they became somewhat historiographic, and then they, they gradually evolved into heroic and other types of narrative. But the concept of narration in a sequence was slow to come to humanity. So to me, all of these uh, references to the past made a lot of sense. They were very helpful to me in beginning to formulate um, a better picture of how we evolved and how we use our method. So in, preserve, in the second book, in this forms of knowledge, which again, here is the book, another one. Both books, by the way, took about 10 years to write because the complexity of the thinking and the integration of, you know, it, these are academic books. So obviously I had to include uh, references and many readings go over the literature in both books. Um, and it took me a long time. But um, this is the second book, A Psychoanalytic Study of Human Communication. Today, I would probably pivot much more to interaction rather than communication, because in our dialogue, in our psychoanalytic clinical dialogue, we study interactions. We, we use, if we do use the counter-transference, we use what we're feeling in the room, what is being conveyed, not just what is said. It's not just linguistic. So I would, I would focus a lot more on, on, the, on the concept of interaction. But in the book, I had the good sense to change the paradigm and say that what, what we need to study as scientific are the forms of interaction themselves. Because each one indicates to us the, the mediational progression. It's in a microcosmic way, but in history, it was macrocosmic to linguistic awareness, the, the, the awareness of being aware, of being conscious. 
And so I, I'm not, I don't know if there's anything here to actually read, but because I've really mentioned most of the most crucial elements of what formed my ideas and where the integration came from and the synthesis of all these many fields. At the same time, of course, many years passed and neuroscience made great leaps. And, uh, you know, the neuroscientists that were interested, like Mark Solms, for instance, who's been wonderful in psychoanalysis, um, have actually proven and brought up to date in neurological terms what Freud observed, this great genius of observation. Um, so I basically used the foundations of the first revision of the epigenetic model, applied it to the observational opportunity in a triadic field, because this is no longer a dyadic field that we are contextually present, but triadic. So it's even more complex. And, and, and wrote this second book. The very controversial subject that I have approached, and I have approached it even in a very personal paper, um, is that of telepathy in dreams. And I think that it, you might be interested in knowing, you know, I did call, in the second book, I did call our epistemology interpenetrative, which meant that we connect once we have a good alliance established and the dialogue is, is in a true psychoanalytic way going well and people bring in dreams, there is established a particular connection, particularly from the patient. And I will tell you a personal story because this is, this is what led to the paper. Um, and it, it deals precisely with things that are, have not found explanations, except if you acknowledge that the body continues to play a very fundamental role in all interactions, whether we are aware of it or not. Um, I was widowed at, some, at, at a certain point in my work. However, nobody knew the name of the husband or even where I lived because I worked from an institute and my office was in an institute. So uh, husband died very suddenly, unexpectedly, and I continued to work throughout. However, during the subsequent weeks, a little bit overlapping the last days of illness and the death, my patients, I would say maybe a third of them, started coming in with unbelievable dreams. Uh, dreams that had elements so telepathic that you couldn't miss it. So I wrote them down, you know, what could I do? Another one female patient came in in tears talking about the death of her father. Her father was alive, he was fine. But anyway, so I, I wrote all these things down and a few years later, I wrote a paper called Morphic Echoes, which was actually subsidized and supported by a group in, um, in New Jersey, oh God, Princeton, a Princeton group that studies these phenomena. And in my second book, I, I call this level morphological because what happened, and I believe this is, what is picked up is a pattern, a pattern with a particular detail, like a color or just a pattern, a, a form of some kind, because this is how the dreams were. And they are tied to the subjects, the dreamers, personal emotions. But I collected enough dreams that I wrote this paper. And so the first, uh, the first level, the first three levels before the linguistic are called morphic sentience. That we, the form of knowledge we have at that level is patterns, just patterns, patterns of experience that connect to our emotions 
or colors or something that's pretty much dreamlike. Above the level of linguistics and denotive, and in other words, the pre-conscious level, is called, I called it lexical sentience, which means that everything we talk about is formulated through the mediation of language and language are denoted, lang words are denotive. They denote something that we can both agree on uh, means that a plant, we both agree is a plant. Um, so above the level of this morphic level is lexical sentience. Uh, and of course, in psychoanalysis, we go way above that. We reflect on that level and then become aware. So that really is the essence of the two books that I have preceded and very much abbreviated. The books are 400 pages each. So it's very, very, this is a very condensed praising of the essence of the two and how they came about. So I, I do hope you have some questions because I, I much prefer a round table where we can all chat. Is there anyone who would like to ask me something? Thank you for a great dance. Oh, thank you. What a lovely thing to say. That is so lovely. Thank you. I'm sure people will have a lot to, to say and ask you about. What what did you say were the eight the eight modes of The age of what? No, no, age, age. I don't understand, sorry. You said something about eight. Um... Oh, the emotional, emotional expressions. Yeah. Basic what, what... emotional expressions. Oh, I wish I could find the page. Um, they are people who study emotions. There's a whole volume, you know, there's a huge literature on the emotions they establish that there are eight basic emotional expressions that we're born with. They're phylogenetic, okay. they're phylogenetically programmed. And, you know, they, they run from uh, fear, anger, disgust, uh, rage, um, amusement, you know, they're, they're very nuanced. Uh, it's interesting because I'm glad you brought that up because in the second book, where I have studied them, you know, they're fresh. This is not fresh on my mind anymore. This, this is old stuff, you know. Um, I differentiated the, the eight emotions that we are born with as phylogenetically given. I differentiate that from emotions because in certain cultures, very quickly, the emotion takes on the cultural form, right? So for instance, in India, I think this means, yes, well, in Italy, it means not so sure, <laughs> you know, or if you do this, in most cultures, it's no, but not in every culture. So very quickly, the emotions take on a cultural uh, veneer, and, and also the child learns to mediate them according to the family uh, structure. You know, if the family doesn't allow emotions, you'll see children swallowing their tears very quickly. So um, I, I believe in differentiating emotions from affects. Affects are the, are the basic phylogenetic givens. Hmm? Of course, from that, one could talk endlessly because, uh, you know, there's, there's all kinds of debates about are there unconscious emotions or are there not unconscious emotions? And, you know, it, it's, it's a huge field of discussion, that of emotions. Does that answer your question or not really? Yes, thank you. Oh, good, I'm glad. Hello, uh, my name's Chris. I, I, I wondered if you could say, or maybe it's just to go back a bit and, and go go perhaps more slowly through it but 
Um, <clears throat> because I, I, you know, I found this very fascinating. It's obviously very intense, and I, I, I need to go and have a look at your your paper. I haven't had a chance to read it yet, but I, I will do that. Um, and you know, you've conveyed an enormous amount. It sounds like about twenty years of work. That's <laughs> pretty pretty That's good. What for, it is. <laughs> Even pretty more good for about forty minutes. Yeah. Um, but um, you know, the the interdisciplinary nature of Freud's work is. It, it, I, which I think you're absolutely right about. And in a way, you're kind of replicating it, his desire to show that his ideas were not only true from a single perspective, but a whole range. And he was extraordinarily well read uh, in the sciences of his of his age. And, you know, and made a good study of linguistics and so on and so forth. But um, so that that I sort of really appreciate. <clears throat> and obviously he had a quite deterministic sense about yeah. sort of causality of these things and and that's that is shifting but there's still something about freud's idea to understand the mechanism what actually motivates at the physical level what's happening which i i can't help but still find quite captivating because we haven't done it yet nobody really actually has answered that question we sort of by step it a bit you know well, which which mechanism are you speaking about specifically well his 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 sense about how the were you talking about mental energy and force and those metaphors that he used and that his work is grounded in physics which it is and and perhaps in sexuality which seemed to him a good a possible solution to what this force was in terms of the physics of it. Um, that's a bit that I still find myself somewhat intrigued by, uh, because it hasn't been solved. It's just sort of seen as well. How, you know, well, how what has to question. be solved? What, what well, do there's, you still, there's still a question about. I think Freud's boldness was to try to actually understand, uh, you know, that a real bridge between the body and the mind. Yeah, that's uh, and, right. Yeah. And that's yeah, exactly, yeah. And it seems as though that hasn't quite been been solved. Now, I, I, I suppose my question for you was about was about how you made the links because you started out very nicely talking about your career as a dancer and thinking about dance and the body. I didn't quite get the way that you bridged the physicality, um, it, it, you know, and the mental structures. So the the bit about the link to the body. And I, I understand that the sort of semiotics of communication, which I think Freud was, you know, good with, very, very good with, yeah, in a way. You, you, that's the problem. He didn't mention right, semiotics okay. at all, and he that did, was, yeah. And that was the mystery that, but but it's it's perfectly understandable. He was a medical neurologist, and you know he was a Darwinian. He was interested in what he was doing. He was also pretty busy. So the, the few semiotic theories that were out, Pierce and maybe the French guy, but he might not have even dealt in it because it was considered literature. It wasn't really science. You know, he may not even have mentioned it or thought about it or even read it, actually. He, he read anthropology. He, he was very, uh, you know, but he was, semiosis doesn't appear. And that's the problem. That's the key to what I tried to do. Semiosis begins from when you're born, where the parents coo over a cradle and point out the, the mobile and, and start to focus your perception in a particular way with a particular sound to it. Already the, the dynamic schematization that takes place in the mediation of experience. The child, the infant is in a global confusion, right? They, there's, the senses are not organized. They're not even differentiated. So the mediation starts right away. And it's always culturally and familiarly determined by the semiotic medium that is used. That's culture. That's how, how the environment educates and cultivates the wild little animal. And another thing I studied that I didn't even mention was the wild children, the children that were found uh, in forests, you know, that had hadn't that had missed out on language because language has a very small window of opportunity. And once it's gone, you, you basically have tremendous trouble learning in language. So um, they're wild, they're wild, they, they shriek, they want to be free, they it's, it's, that is the mediation in the brain. 
the, the, the issue, the, the most interesting thing to me is that with all of the advances in neuroscience, uh, I don't think they'll ever find semiosis in the brain because it's everywhere. It's everywhere. It's at every level. And it starts in the body, quite literally. But we're not aware of that because we use our voice, our tongue and our voice. That's the mediation that we have with the other. But, you know, I mean, children, if you look at a child, even for 10 minutes, their body tells you everything about what they're feeling. You can't mistake it. Right. So the mediation occurs through the body into language very gradually. And our dialogue, the clinical dialogue, is extremely specialized. It's a special way of talking and interpreting. Okay, thank you. Is that helpful? It, oh, it no, actually, helpful, yeah. I, want to, I want to pick up something you said because it's very interesting. You pointed to infantile sexuality. Yes, of course. He starts with the wonderful metaphors that he uses for for the body <laughs> mouth anus you know and and he, the, remember piaget hadn't even come into the picture yet piaget was 40 years later so developmental studies were almost non-existent they were they came later everything after freud so there's a lot to integrate into his foundational observations does that help yeah, that, you got me. You got me there. You, you, you managed to sneak in the answer to the first question just in the last couple of seconds. Well, because very interesting, because, you know, Freud's yeah. drives, I mean, it's the basis. Yeah, I think that's right. It's going to it might be quite interesting what what might happen now, which might be that people begin to recognize that the brain doesn't need to be the center of the study. In fact, you, you can begin to re revise the whole thing by saying that the brain isn't centered in the head as it were that actually the body and the exactly. brain are completely integrated well exactly the is of the whole the whole mechanism that's right exactly the embodied a studied of the embodied human you know this is but this is in the air yeah hmm. especially now that well i've just written a big paper on algorithms <laughs> that was a whole new thing to alert people on the danger of becoming addicted to computers and what the algorithm makes you do in language because it's completely disembodied the algorithm can only do what you've put into it well we won't go into algorithms now that's very far but it is our modern world well thank you very much for the question Pleasure. I guess I'd like to dive into what you were mentioning about the wild child and a little mm. bit of what you've been discussing now. I had, um, uh, for me, it was kind of an eye opener. I was speaking with a, um, uh, a doctor who was working with the uh, uh, deaf and blind. And uh, she was she was saying, uh, and this is maybe 30 years ago, uh, I was just so impressed with what she was doing. I think she was probably very much the cutting edge at the moment. Um, and she was talking also about the window of opportunity that the, 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 the deaf and uh, blind, um, baby uh you have to get in there and she said you can almost imagine uh and she, i think she was even saying it that that they have found that it there's a there's a way that the potential has to be unraveled has to be unwound in order to come into a communication and uh when it isn't when it isn't unwound and it doesn't happen it's it's the wild child. It's it it won't happen. So I found that very interesting what you were saying and corroborating so, what. So these are these were infants that are congenitally blind and, uh, and deaf. Congenitally, though, born that way. That's right. That's yeah. right. That's right. Amazing. She, yeah. yeah, she was working with them, and I thought, my goodness. But what 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 results was she able to obtain? 
Well, she she had real, you know, we have this, uh, you know, the Helen Keller uh, story. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but and, she, uh, I think she she was she was she born? Yeah, I don't think she, she was think born. So. Mm. Right. But not deaf though. I thought Helen, she was also deaf. Yes. I don't know. I I, I don't know the details, oh, but Helen, I do know the very famous book. Yeah. Right, the Helen Keller. I think she was deaf and blind. But she was exceptionally intelligent too, wasn't she? When, yeah. But she had her, she had her person who opened that up, that unwound the communication of potential. Yeah, because it's all neurological, and it's what if you make the connections, mm -hmm. if the neurological connections are made early enough, they're there, you know, and then they're used because we are such a social species you know yes. I, the, the the gentleman before you asked a very inter interesting question because um freud's drives oh you've disappeared freud's drives <laughs> um don't specify enough attachment you know which of course came after the war the great bulby bulby books on attachment was studied later by Anna Freud and Bowlby, John Bowlby. Um, but the whole premise of, of transference is based on attachment, on the type of attachment that you study. You study what happens in the, in the interaction of an attached patient. So um, all of this to say that anything at all that is socially uh, relevant, the nervous system picks up and will use with whatever sense imaginable, touch, anything, taste, um, to preserve this connection with other people. So I'm just referring to the fact that if they can't see and they can't hear, they will touch, they will put in their mouth, any, uh, right? Anything at all to make a social, to be in connection with the outside world. Yeah. Not to That's be- That's one of the, one of the, points that you were making in your paper you were you were talking about the group and mm. so I think the the emphasis on the social and the group that you've made I think is very important mm -hmm. oh yeah right. yes in, in a sense the dyad although I love the dyad it's it's a rather protected environment you know it's it's only it's very enveloping it's an it's a womb of sorts Yeah. So anybody else? Different type of question. I suppose uh, one thing that um, struck me reading your paper and uh, listening to you is how is the drive for continuity. Mm -hmm. the, the drive to make a theory, to make a story, to tie it together, to, uh, and um, I suppose, uh, temperamentally, I'm not that way. Oh. You know, I quite like gaps between things and things that don't really fit together. And uh, but uh, but the people generally <laughs> um, seem to have a, a deep impulse to create a continuity in the story, and I I don't know whether that urge for continuity fits into what you're describing. I mean, is this urge to narrative or urge to um, link things up or where you would uh, place this kind of urge for continuity. You mean in me personally, or as a topic? Well, I well either or both. Or I mean, it does seem to be a lot of a lot of therapists are very preoccupied with how to you know have a developmental continuity or mm, a, that's so a, interesting a continuity of the therapy or whatever, and they get very nervous <laughs> if they feel they can't find it or um 
That's or very, they, very, very interesting. Or they, very might, interesting. they might like be on attack the patient by saying that this is an attack on linking. Um, <laughs> you know, because well, uh, go ahead. I, I I find that such an interesting question. Uh, if, Personally, it may, it's on the button. You're right on the button. Um, the, imp the impetus for me is to try to understand something. And since Freud, all over his writings, says that this has to be revised, it has to be modernized, this is incomplete. Uh, we reach a point and then we stop because we can't go on. We don't have an explanatory model. Uh, for me, uh, it became, okay, so, so let's try to do that. Let's try to understand it better in with modern information. Um, continuity between my passion for Freud, it was a real passion, um, and my personal life, which I was severed from everything that I adored in Europe. I was educated in England, but I'm Italian. And then I was put on a ship to come to America and I was underage, I was a minor, so I didn't really want to. And uh, once here, I said, well, nobody's gonna send me anywhere else. And so I have an incredible urge to not only understand, but to link everything and keep it all together. Uh, not so much in clinical work, because I find that some people separate each session and make it very complete unto itself and other people will say, oh, remember last week this, we were talking about this and uh, this is what's happened since oh, I let, I let them be. But um, <clears throat> the desire to make sense of something, I think requires a connection to something before in a way, because even the dialogue, it builds on itself. You don't forget what someone said or did, you know, it, it sort of builds and evolves. And, you know, we have a process. Yes, a process is continuous uh, as I see it. It's fragmented. It also, in the second book, another thing I did was study rituals. I, I had a great passion for rituals, primitive rituals. Um, it was a great, I think he's British. I'm not sure his name is Turner. And yeah. Then, yeah. Victor. Yeah, Victor, that's right. You're, you're familiar with him. And he delineates the phases of a ritual. Well, ours is a dialogical ritual. We have a beginning, then we have the, the liminal phase when there is, the, the defenses have broken down, there's a solid alliance, there's a liminal phase, and then there's the reconstruction and integration of a new story, the narrative of the conscious patient. And so, um, yeah, I, but I think the gentleman before his, the importance of interdisciplinarity in our field. I mean, we're studying the mind, you know, it's unending. You know, there's no limit to the subjects and to what we can learn about it. Mm. So I think that that's an extremely interesting subject in and of itself, the, the need to connect everything and keep it all tied. Yeah, very interesting. You know, for me, these two books that are preceded in the chapter, the continuity was, okay, so this is my study. This is my, you know, in ballet, you train for 15 years, 15 years of training. You have to start as a pretty much a toddler. Otherwise, you can't do ballet. So these are my years of study. And then, and then I subsume them into a book because it keeps it all synthesized and integrated. And now I've gone on to other things. And as I said, now I'm on to the algorithm, if you can imagine that. That's a big problem, that is. Huge, huge. It's changing uh, humanity. It's changing how we relate, how we talk, how we think. Young people are mesmerized by this screen and what's behind it, in it, what it does. It's just... It's a nightmare. Yeah, it's another world. Anybody else? So I'll just come back to continuity since that's a bit of a preoccupation of mine. 
um, that, uh, you know, Deleuze, Deleuze and Guattari, the philosophers, French philosophers, um, they, they say that, you know, time is not a continuity, that we think of time as <laughs> something that is sort of seamless and unending, and we place things in right. this endless thing, but they say that <clears throat> that's actually not how time is. And um, they have an idea of like three different kinds of time. And each of these kinds of time is a different experience, a different form, a different structure. But also what's interesting to me is there isn't, that there's a kind of gap between these different, if you like, realms of time. Mm -hmm. so you can be in one and then suddenly you're in another. So mm. that, that to me clinically makes a lot of sense because someone can be, you can be talking with somebody and they, they'll say, nothing's happening. You know, we've been talking now for two years, nothing's happening. And then suddenly they come in and they've had a dream and they're in a totally different place, right? So I would call that a different kind of time. Mm. But you can't actually map out how they got from this time to this time it just sort of happened and mm. I, to me that's a bit like beyond where beyond says when change happens you don't know how it happened right mm. that uh, suddenly there it is <laughs> um mm -hmm. so, uh, Absolutely. Yeah. i do find the whole question around continuity lack of continuity fascinating mm, sounds wonderful the, the, this viewpoint of the three different perceptions of time sounds wonderful, yeah. Of course, Freud said that the unconscious was timeless, coming, you know, coming close to, uh, I guess, to the reality of Einstein, you know, that, that time doesn't really exist at all, not as we think of it. You know, we live chronologically, uh, and so, and we're biological creatures, you know. So biological, anything that's alive does have, a, cer a certain continuity, right? They grow, they thrive, and then they decline, and then die. Don't you think that it's built in? That Well, that process is built in, but the question is, you know, what is the mind? What is the soul? What is... Oh, yeah. What's the human identity? <laughs> in oh, the yeah. All that? That's huge. And, and now, I don't know how it is in England, but I think it's similar. You know, many patients go off and take these drugs, right, and have experiences of timelessness within the, within a sort of a wholeness through these drugs. So that's also in the brain somewhere, right? It must be, if it's triggered by these substances. Mm -hmm. And of course, that lends itself to spirituality, very much part of us, our human condition, to have some spiritual part of us yeah the, it's very interesting so you you would advocate dropping the notion of time altogether then when you're listening you're just sitting okay yes yeah, well, yeah, i'm a big beyond fan you know without mm -hmm. memory and desire so. right yes yes <laughs> um so um you're working on algorithms, so where do you go next? Oh, no, I'm not working. I've done my paper. Huh? I, I submitted myself to six months of agony on a subject I didn't even know what the algorithm was. But um, because I'm involved with two academic groups in, in Europe, one is code, well, one is code biology. At this point, I'm more involved with that. And it's the premise that codes have been at the center of macroevolutionary shifts. Um, this is Barbieri. Uh, he was, by the way, he was at Cambridge when Crick discovered the double helix. So he's very much a code person, <laughs> right? Codes are very central to him. But, but I, to me, the, the, this new algorithmic algebraic code that can trigger a program in the computer that we live with and how it's impacted, especially young people. 
it was just so important. Um, and that I, I just had to know more about it. And I wanted to bring, uh, I have another book coming out, which is 13 lectures that I've been giving over the 13 years with these groups. Um, this last one moves into what the scientists have called in, in 2022, they called us, we have moved into the Anthropocene. And I found that so ironic because here we are with A1 and, and <laughs> all kinds of robots and we're dependent on screens and we're, we're becoming less and less human. Uh, you know, at least that's the danger. So I just wrote this paper to, to sort of free myself of this subject that I needed to understand a little better. But no, no, I, now I'm, I'm old. I mean, retirement would be ideal, <laughs> but I don't see it. It's not in the, not in the picture. Right. Nice walk in the, in the English countryside would be nice too. Good. Well, thank you for a, a fascinating uh, evening and very, very stimulating discussion. Uh, thank you for, you know, visiting it us. A, it was a great pleasure, a great pleasure to have the discussion. Thank you very much, David, and everyone who came. Thank bye you. Bye-bye. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.